slides that prepared by Pastor Noel. And on behalf of all of us, we want to uh, show our uh, gratitude to uh, Pastor Noel and his team. All right, we are ready to uh, receive God's uh, word from you, Prophet Robert. Uh, the floor is yours now. Yes. And we just want to pray for you before we start. Father, please, thank, please. You. thank you for uh, a wonderful uh, friend, a spiritual father, a spiritual mentor, Prophet Robert, Dr. Robert Matwari. Lord, that you bless his ministry, his ministry Amen. of uh, particularly the shortwave radio that has gone to many nations that could not be reached by usual means of the internet. Amen. So Father, I want to bless him and his household, <laughs> his wonderful wife, Amen. Janet, and uh, his children and his grandchildren and the children generation that follows, that you will give him even greater download as he share what Abba Father you have given to him in terms of this revelatory teaching that we are so blessed to receive it. In the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. 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 Over to you, Prophet. Amen and amen. Well, I'd like to say Shabbat Shalom again to shalom. all that are listening, the kings of the East that are gathered together. Um, we are living in a tremendous time, a prophetic time, a time of visitation. The Lord is pouring out His Spirit with that measure. There is, a, there is a shaking that's taking place all over the world. And now we know from it is written that this is the time of the church's greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit. As we move into the prophetic um, and we see from the prophetic perspective, the interpretation of current events, global events, nothing happens in history without God's pre-approval. There is a timeline and all history has been pre-written and given in predictions, in biblical pr predictions that tells us the whole history of the church, the history of the world, because our Father loves us so much that he wants us in on the secret, uh, kind of like, preview of history. He wants us to have that preview so that we would know how to go forward in the power that raised up Christ from the dead as we walk in revelatory um, guidance, as we receive new impartation and revelation each time we, we are in the throne room. Because all this interpretation of biblical prophecy has to do with intimacy, entering into the throne of grace. Because these things are not, you cannot process them with your mind. You can only process prophecy through the spirit. It is the spirit that gave the, the prophecies. It is the spirit that interprets prophecies. So as, as we begin the, this prophetic teaching tonight, uh, this, 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 this morning, the most important thing is to ask the Holy Spirit, grant me wisdom, understanding, an illumination of your Holy Spirit so that I understand what you're saying to me and how to apply the knowledge you're giving me because my people perish for lack of knowledge. God wants his people to have the knowledge of what time it is, knowledge of what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, the knowledge that will guide you as you prepare for the future because the, the future has been revealed to you so that you won't be uh, caught up in the in the in the redress of the world in, into the, the the you know the the social media propaganda um, disinformation misinformation because it's the age of delusion deception. We need to go back. To, it is written because here we have a solid foundation and clear understanding of the mysteries that are unfolding before us. Today, we want to deal with the seven church ages, the seven periods of the church. Church history was written before the foundation of the world. The events that would take place during the 2,000 years of the church age, the dispensation of grace, were revealed to John on the island of Patmos. He was given 
the sequence of events. He was given the events that will take place in each period of the church or each church period. There are seven, seven periods of the church. Everything in biblical prophecy is, is, in, is, not, is governed by the number seven. The metrics of the kingdom is seven because seven is the number for perfection, completion. So from the beginning of the church age to the end of the church age, we have all the events that are going to take place given to us in advance. This is why we know our God controls history, that he is the Lord of history, that he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end, that there is nothing that's going to happen in the church without his pre-knowledge. Your life and my life has been preordained. Everything that's going to happen to us has been already recorded. We are called to come into the kingdom and we're called to receive the, the kingdom because the kingdom of God is within us and that king is within us and that king is the one that leads us in kingdom in the kingdom ways, the kingdom lifestyle, and the kingdom resources being given to us, and the kingdom revelation being given to us, and the kingdom authority, the spheres of influence is being given to us. In other words, we are a manifestation of the preordained purposes of God. Because we are chosen by God, set apart by God, given the assignment by God, God wants us to then know what's going to happen in our world. What's going to happen with the church? In the seven church periods or ages, the seven church ages, which are represented by the seven churches of the book of Revelation. Now, in this prophetic teaching, I want to, before I even go into it, I want to give you the big picture so that you can connect the dots. The seven churches represents AD 30 to AD 2030, 2000 years of the church dispensation. Now, after the church dispensation, we are also given the seven seals, which represents the final church age, the events that are happening right now, the last seven seals represents the end of the church age. So we will look at the seven church periods, then we will look at the seven seals that goes from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ to the rapture of the church. I will say this again because this is the key to prophetic understanding the book of Revelation. Revelation chap from chapter 1 to chapter to chapter 10 gives us the complete prophecies concerning the church and the church age and the res the, the, the death from the death of Jesus Christ the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the resurrection of the church in the post pre rough rapture. So it gives us the period from the ascension of Jesus to the return of Jesus, the rapture. Where is this recorded? It's recorded from Revelation chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 10. In other words, if you want to know the events that are going to take place until the rapture, they are recorded in the book of Revelation from Revelation 1 to Revelation 10. That completes all the events. Now, when you go from chapter 11, we'll go to that and show that that is the parallel. The complete history of the church is contained between Revelation 1 and Revelation 10. Revelation 10 completes the church age. and. When I say that the church age 
is completed in Revelation chapter 6, the rapture. Then from chapter 6 to, to, chapter, to chapter 10, that is the wrath of God. I'm laying this just at the beginning so that as we go through this, you'll have it in your, in your mind, the framework. Seven churches represents the whole church dispensation of grace, the church age. After the church age, is towards the end of the church age, there are seven seals that leads to the rapture. And that completes in Revelation chapter 6, verse 17. For those are students of prophecy, this lays to you the matrix of the book of Revelation, how it's designed. Because the confusion has been how the book of Revelation is designed. It's a mystery. And that mystery, I'm simply decoding it, explaining it, and revealing it, that it's actually very clear, very simple. Uh, it's uh, the sequence of events are given, and they are correct sequence of events. There is no confusion, no interlapping. It is the clear narrative from the ascension of Jesus, the, from Pentecost, the church is born, to the church that's going to be caught up to me, the Lord, in the air. That is the post pre wrath rapture now having laid that foundation i want to begin by explaining the church age because now we are at the close of the church age the church age is the age of grace the age of the holy spirit where we are led by the holy spirit and empowered by the holy spirit our understanding of revelation is through the spirit of Jesus because the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So we are being taught by the Holy Spirit. The teacher is within us. Even when I'm speaking right now, you cannot grasp these things unless the Holy Spirit helps you because these things are not taught, they're caught. They are revelation that comes into your spirit, man. You suddenly see the picture. Revelation 1 to Revelation to chapter 10. That's the whole church history and the and the, the great tribulation and the rapture. You, you, you begin to put it all together so that when you go back to reading the scripture, you'll be able to understand this whole passage, these passages that are goes from Genesis, uh, from, sorry, from Revelation chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 10. That's the history of the church, the history of what happens until the end of time, meaning. The history of the church ends in chapter 6, verse 17. The church's rapture is gone. From chapter 7, ch ch chapter 7, chapter 7 is the numbering of the of this of the 144 uh from the 12 tribes, and after that, the wrath of God. And after the wrath of God, the Jew the Jewish people begin to, to clean the land and prepare for the second coming of the Lord with the church. So this is a summary of the whole book of Revelation. And right now, we're going we're gonna to go from the seven churches, because the seven churches represents the seven periods of the church. That from AD 30 to AD 100 was the apostolic church, that radical church that received the power on the day of Pentecost, and was radicalized by the Holy Spirit. Filled with power, they ran out of the upper room to the porch of Solomon, the Solomon's porch at the temple, and proclaimed the gospel, and 3,000 people were born again on the day of Pentecost. We go back to, the, to Mount Sinai, that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 died, when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments. And at Pentecost, 3,000 are saved. So that's the beginning of the apostolic church. 3,000 people in Jerusalem. These were Jews, the first fruit of the Jewish church. So from then, there is a, is a period of persecution, uh, deportation, uh, the, the church was so comfortable in Jerusalem 
They didn't want to go anyway, but wait for Jesus. Just like most believers today, they don't want to do anything. They just want to wait for Jesus and ripped out. Well, that was what the early church thought. Oh, let's just stay here in Jerusalem, breaking bread, fellowshipping, praising the Lord, and waiting for his coming. And God sent persecution to drive them to the nations so that they can carry the message to the nations. I believe that this decade, this very time, there'll be great shaking among the, the nations to drive the people of God to where God wants them to be. Because the church would have not taken the gospel to the nations if it were not of the great the, the persecution that God sent the persecution to drive them to where God wanted them to be. I believe the persecution of the church that's here now will drive the church to the nations of the world to where God wants the church to be because the church is not listening. The church is not wanting to go anywhere or not. They don't even want to do anything. They just want to wait for Jesus in their prayer meetings, Bible studies, and just wait for Jesus. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God wants us as an end time church to take the message to the nations. Matthew 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to every nation, then shall the end come. And I believe that God has given this assignment to the kings of the east. That you are the chosen. You need to be now the anointed to receive the anointing and the matching orders to the nations. The nations of the East that are those countries, those are the nations that God has preserved the kings of the East to finish the king's business. Because it's coming back soon, just like the early church, the apostolic church was given the mandate to their generation, but they did not feel like going anywhere to strange places, strange people. They wanted to stay home and wait for Jesus and just have fellowship and Bible study and enjoy themselves. And for God, that God so loved the world that he wants everyone to know about Jesus. He desires that all men might be saved. So because of that, he, 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 he sent persecution to the church in Jerusalem to get them to where God wanted to be. He wanted them to be among the nations, sharing Jesus. That's why the persecution is coming to the church in these days because we're too comfortable. We don't want to go. We don't want to do anything. We want to just enjoy ourselves and wait for the Lord. But God, knowing that, the scripture talks about the great tribulation that will drive the, the people of God to the nations and multitudes that cannot be numbered will be born again. We haven't seen nothing yet. The revival is going to, is here now. And this revival is going to take the church to the nations of the world. When Pentecost happened, it prepared the church to penetrate every culture, to bring Jesus to every, to every people group. The same is happening right now. The church is waiting for the anointing. And I say the anointing is here. And I would say that the Lord is coming through the Eastern Gate. So the glory of God is coming through the Eastern Gate. And the church in the East is receiving the anointing and the calling to prayer and intercession to hear the Lord, to seek the plan of the Father, to be about the Father's business and finish the Father's king, the kingdom business. This is why we are learning prophecy. The purpose of Knowing prophecy, knowing the events before us, has to do with one thing and one thing only, to motivate you to rise and shine for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Because Jesus said, blessed are they that hear and do, not hear and think, hear and talk, but hear and do. So these prophetic teachings have to do with you knowing these are the last days, asking the Father, what do you want me to do? 
You have brought me into the kingdom for such a time as this. What is it that you want me to do right now? What is my assignment? What is my calling? Because everybody has a place in the divine economy. There is a reason. That's why he reveals the time. He reveals the events that are coming so that we will know the signs of the times. We'll be able to say, now is the time to accelerate taking the message to those who do not know the Lord because time is running out. The apostolic church, driven by, the, by, by persecution, they went to the nations and carried Jesus to the nations. That was the beginning of world evangelism. And that will also be the end of world evangelism through persecution when the church is fleeing because of persecution. Wherever they go, God goes with them and God uses them in strange places with strange people because God has already prepared where we're going to go, what we're going to do in these last days. That's why the persecution of the church is coming because the church is slipping. The church is not ready. The church is like the early church, too comfortable, not wanting to go anywhere or do anything. Let's sit back and wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, just like the early church wanted to do. And by the year 100, they'd gone through the known world. They'd taken the gospel, turned the world upside down. The whole known world was reached with the gospel by the apostolic church. So the apostolic church is a, a church that was dedicated to the evangelization of the world. That marks the early church. Taking the power of God with demonstration, declaration with demonstration, miracles and signs and wonders. That's what characterized the apostolic church. And by the year 100, we have, in AD 90, we have John on the island of Patmos. His eyes gorged out. He is in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he begins to receive this revelation of the seven periods of the church. And he writes that uh, whole book of revelation on the island of Patmos to give to us at the end of the apostolic age. Now we enter into the next age, which is Samana, which is that was Ephesus. This is Samana. Samana is a, it's a martyrdom church, great persecution of the church by Rome. Many perished. And that in itself is what turned the Roman world upside down. That's what changed Rome from a pagan empire to a Christian empire because when they saw the joy of the, of the martyrs, of those being martyred, being uh, killed for their faith, the joy, the, 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 just the, the peace they had, the excitement they had, the lack of fear of death is what shook the foundation of the Roman Empire. Because they saw a people with holy boldness, willing to die, to lay down their lives for their faith. That is what caused the transformation. Because the more they killed the Christians, the more people turned to the Lord until they permeated all of Rome. The whole Roman Empire was filled with Christians, persecuting them and killing them. And more people were being saved as they watched the joy of these martyrs, as they watched how they were not afraid of death. They realize there's something behind these people. They have something. Jesus is indeed alive. Because the people that were giving the witness of Jesus were willing to lay down their lives. They were not afraid to die. That's what turned the world upside down. That is what's going to turn this generation, this terminal generation, turn them around and more people are going to be saved during this great tribulation that has already begun. Because we are that generation that's going to go through the same persecution to take us to the nations, to take us to the action stations where we are supposed to be, where we're supposed to minister, where God has prepared the people that are waiting for us to arrive with the good news. We are carriers of the good news because we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have the power to heal the sick, cast out devils, 
open the eyes of the blind as we go in the power of the Holy Spirit because fleeing, fleeing, running away from danger is what the Bible tells us. Jesus said, when you see these things, don't hang around, don't wait, flee to the mountains. So fleeing, living and going to a place of hiding is exactly what God wants and he uses that to relocate people for his purposes. Because in good times, people wouldn't normally go there. They wouldn't want to go there. They're too comfortable in Jerusalem. So God will use again the great tribulation to disperse the people of God to where God wants them. We've done enough fellowship, enough reading the Bible, enough prayer meetings. We've done it all. And the world is dying around us. And God is going to say, okay, I've heard all your prayers. It's time you go. You run. Run for your dear life. As you run, I'm going to run with you and take you to exactly where I want you to be to share Jesus. That's why more people are going to be saved as we see in the early apostolic church and Samana church. We begin to see even greater martyrdom taking place. And that shook again the Roman Empire. The nation of the world will be shaken as the church rises up in the east and begin to walk in power, in majesty, in glory. I'm talking about declarations with demonstrations. These signs will follow them that believe. Supernatural manifestations. Things that the world will stand back and say, wow, now we know God is real. People want to see miracles. And the miracles are coming and they're coming now. The anointing for the supernatural is upon all the believers in these days. As they step out, the release will come. The moment that the priest put their foot in the river Jordan, it dried up. They had to step into that situation. And as we step into the situation, of our divine calling, miracles start happening. The supernatural start taking place. People say, I don't see miracles. Well, you will see miracles. Because when you lose everything and you're fleeing for dear life, the Lord is fleeing with you. He's taking you actually to where he wants you to be, where he's going to use you, because there's so much more to be done. It's going to be done during this period that has begun. The, the, Isolation of the, the people of God, for persecution, the plan of the enemy to destroy the church. The more the devil is going to try to destroy the church like he did in the past, the more the church grows. When it gets tough, the tough gets going. We are chosen and we won't lose our election in Christ because of persecution. But we manifest Christ during the persecution. He shines through us. So we see that more as you lo look at the church history during that period uh, of Samana church, the martyrdom church, you, you marvel at the holy boldness. You marvel at the joy for martyrdom, how they were recklessly abandoned to the Lord. That church is coming back. That boldness is coming back. That recklessness is coming back because these churches are there for our example. They tell us how to walk to, through the great tribulation, how to be joyful through the great tribulation, how to be victorious through the great tribulation. Because God is calling for a triumphant church, not a defeated church, but a church that would triumph over the Antichrist and the false prophet in these last days, just like the, the Samana church did. They triumphed over the powers of darkness and by 313, Rome began to recognize them. By 315, for the first time, they were given the right to worship, to assemble. First time in the history of Rome, that they allowed the believers to meet openly without being persecuted. By 325, the Nicene Council 
the church become official, the official religion of the Roman Empire. The church grew martyrdom, defeated Rome, and Rome had to bow down and surrender to the church. This is what's going to happen in these last days. We go from um, the uh, Samana church and we enter into a period after the church in 315, 325, the church was taken into Babylonian captivity. The absence of persecution led the church to compromise, to adopting pagan rituals into the church. Rome came into the church and transformed the church. So the church went into Babylonian captivity and the miraculous supernatural began to live because now it, the church has moved from being an organism, a living organism, to an organization with a hierarchy controlled by men and led by men. It ceased to be what God wanted the church to be. He wanted the church to remain an organism, a living organism where Jesus Christ is the head. Now the church has a head as a pope, a headman who defined everything. No longer was the Holy Spirit given the authority to, to define the church, to lead the church. Now the church was being led by man, by a council, by hierarchy, and by dogma, which is the doctrines of men and demons. So the church became perverted from within. That is what happened in 325 AD. The, the Nicene Council, that's the Pergamum, Pergamum compromising church. And Pergamos is the place where the seat of the devil is. So the devil moved his seat into the church and began to run the church from within. Pergamos, representing where the seat of Satan is, he moved into the church to control the church. And that went on until five, 590, five, five, in 590 five, to 1517, Tiamara, that is the Roman Catholic Howard Church. Because from 590 to, five, to 1517, Tiamara, a Roman Catholic, our church dominated. Then in 1573 to 1700, Sardis, the Reformation, 1517, Martin Luther, salvation by faith alone, by Christ alone, by grace alone, sola fide, sola gratia. This is the rest restoration of the church to its apostolic foundation. This is not the restoration. This is the reformation. So the reformation was trying to get back to the apostolic church. The return to the apostolic church is restoration from reformation to restoration. We'll talk about that. Because the church is still under the re reformation, not restoration. So we see now 1517, the, 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 the Catholic domination, then in 1571 to 700, 1700, Sardis, we see the reformation. Um, the church is rising up, God's moving, and we see now the great reawakening that united the, the colonies in North America. It was the great reawakening, the greatest move of the Holy Spirit from the East Coast to the West Coast of America that transformed the people of America and united the people of America who were separated. These were separate 50 nations, 50 states separate. 
with not, no commonality. There was nothing to, to bring them together, to glue them together until the Great Reawakening. That Great Reawakening is what birthed the United States of America. People having a common faith, a common love for Jesus, for the word of God, a common vision to take the gospel to the nations. We, we hear some of the, the greatest preaching, Bill Sunday, uh, one of the greatest preachers in America. We see the, the breaking out of the church from the limitations of, of what you would call reformation. Reformation was halfway, but here we are beginning to see now the breaking away into a new dimension closer to the restoration. The revival was the restoration of the move of God that transformed the world. In other words, the, the reformation, the re reformation that led to the to the revival, the great revival, and the great revival led to the great missionary movement. Missionaries from America to the corners of the earth with a passion for Jesus once again, bringing the gospel to the nations because of the visitation from heaven. The great revival, the great awakening that brought many of the nations to the Lord. We see in, 19, in 1910, the World Conference on World Evangelization taking place. The church gathered together in Edinburgh to now work on how do we reach the entire world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hudson Taylor going to, 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 to the east, missionaries to China, missionaries to Africa, to the nation of the world, because they had a visitation, the revival, the Holy Spirit moving again. Transformation comes only when the church really comes to the place of surrender, fasting and praying and waiting upon the Lord. Transformation takes place and the impartation of power comes to the church and the church become radically transformed. People willing to go again to the nations of the world and die. Many missionaries died on the mission field because something had happened. The Lord had touched them. The power of God has come upon them. They gave up on their wealth. They gave up on money. They gave up on materialism. They were more in love with Jesus than material, material things. And they were willing to lay down their lives around the globe. This is what's coming. There is a church that God's raising. There's a visitation that's coming to the, a back to the church. Something is about to happen. There is a sound on top of the mulberry trees. God is on the move. And that move is going to break open. The gates of hell will not be able to prevail. This church that God is raising up, the kings of the east that is raising up for such a time as this, with fasting and praying, all night prayer meetings, intercessions, they're going to break through into that glorious liberty of the sons of God where they're going to hear the Lord, where they're going to be led by the Lord and empowered by the Lord to be bold and courageous and confront the forces of darkness. I believe we are at the threshold of that. I believe the church in the East is at the threshold of the greatest revival of all time, that the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit as it was on the day of Pentecost is coming and it's going to release an army that's going to come out of the kings of the East to the nations. Then the army of the kings of the east that will go to the battle of Obama, Armageddon, 200 million. But before that, there is a move of God and power coming out of the spiritual kings of the east. Before the political kings of the east unite themselves together. And the, the nations of the east are already joining. The, the China is joining Russia, is joining um, Turkey and all these countries that are coming against Israel, they're already moving before the church moves. The church is missing its divine appointment to be ahead of the enemy. They already stayed up. The church has not been stayed up. The kings of the east, because it's coming through the eastern gate, and the eastern gate has been opened. But the church is still caught up in the smallness of life, in the, in the cares of this world. They have not caught the fire. 
that I say the fire is coming. I say, yes, the fire is coming. Yes, the, the glory is coming. The Shekinah glory. And the church in the East will be unstoppable. The world will be turned upside down. More people will be brought in the kingdom than any, any, any time. And those are the people that when John was looking, he saw multitudes that could not be numbered. He said, where are they coming from? He said, these have come out of the great tribulation. Because they saw the, the, the saints during the tribulation laying down their lives, joyfully laying down their lives, proclaiming the gospel. And many, multitudes, multitudes and multitudes of people, many, many people re receiving Jesus, being saved, brought into the kingdom because of the testimony, the testimony of a holy, bold church recklessly abandoned to the Lord with a single vision to know him and to make him known. That is the church of the end time. It's not a dead church. It's not a weak church. It's not a fearful church. It's a bold church with holy boldness, a triumphant, victorious church, unafraid, because they know who they are and they know whose they are, that they are the sons of the Most High God, that God is with them, that there's not a power on earth that can, that can take away their eternal life. They are willing to, to lay down their lives because they know that for them to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is the church that God is raising among the kings of the East, a recklessly abandoned church to the Lord. I'm talking of the remnant of the Lord that are willing to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. The Lord is calling, is speaking, is inviting whosoever wants to step into the glory, the Shekinah glory, the manifest presence of God can step in because we see great reawakening with the Church of Philadelphia. That is the church of brotherly love. We saw that great um, charismatic renewal movement that swept across the world, across the denominations. That great, great charismatic movement that touched every denomination and every continent. Then that died off in 1967 when Israel took Jerusalem to begin to prepare for the sacrifices, the building of the third temple, the end of time in 1967, the Laodicean church, the lukewarm church, compromised, compromised, even now attempting to change the scriptures, to remove all the offensive passages of scriptures in, in order to condone moral perversion. The Bible is being tempered with by the church. Many other translations that are out there already been tempered with. Changing a word here and a word there, removing the word blood, the, name, the blood of Jesus to where it says blood, they say sacrifice in order to, to bring people away from the, the blood religion of the Bible because everything in the Bible is about blood, the blood of animals, the blood of Jesus. It's all about the blood. Because without a shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So we see here the removal of the cross of Jesus Christ and the centrality of Christ. Even now, there are churches that are now removing the virgin birth of Jesus, removing the, 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 the very fundamentals of the scripture, denying the deity of Jesus. This is the church today. And we're seeing the church embracing immorality. Because we are now in the Lord of Sea and Church. We are now living in the days as it was in the days of Noah. But there was Noah. He was righteous in his generation. There is a church that is righteous in this generation. There is a remnant 
that will stand for the Lord will not yield. They are not people pleasers. Because when you please people, you can't please God. These are God chasers. They chase God. They are separated unto him. They've come out of the compromise of the church, the lukewarm church, the traditional church. The church that does not know what term it is, does not know, it does not know what are the issues that we have to deal with because they don't know what term it is, they don't know the events that are coming, they are not prepared for the events, the events that are coming. They are the whore, the church riding the beast. That whore rides the beast, the political beast, the end time beast. The church will marry the Antichrist, will embrace the Antichrist. That's what this Bible says. Jesus said, will I find faith when I come back? That's what 2 Thessalonians says clearly. The Antichrist will not be revealed until the falling away of the church, the compromise, the carnality, the materialism, the self-love, self self-preservation. Self that spirit is dominating the church. Controlling the church, that is the falling away. Falling away into materialism and self-love. But God is calling for a remnant, a holy remnant, a people that are sold out to Jesus with a single vision, with a simple, with a single mission, mission driven, focused on the Lord, with a love for Jesus and compassion for a dying world. That's the generation of the overcomers, the end time generation, the kings of the East that will lead the nations of the world. Just like Israel led with the apostolic church and the apostolic church gave the message to Europe because Paul was told, go west young men, go west young men. So the gospel went into Europe and from Europe it came to America. From America, it went to the, the kings of the East. Now the mandate is with the kings of the East to finish the, that round-the-globe trip to back to Jerusalem. That's why the movement in, in Asia, back to Jerusalem, it's, the, it's, a, it's a biblical movement. It's a movement whose time has come. It is a mandate that God is saying to the kings of the East, it's time to march right back to Jerusalem, take this gospel, defile the gospel throughout the Arab nations, the resistant nations, lay down your life until you reach Jerusalem and surrender the, the, the baton to the king and take that, it's like the fire, the, the Olympic fire. The, the torch now is in the hands of the kings of the east. Now they are tracking through the whole of uh, Southeast Asia into, into, in, in, into the Middle East, right back to Jerusalem, and the king will come. And there, the Mount of Mount Olives will meet the king. That's the journey that began on the day of Pentecost, now to be finished and completed by the kings of the East. I will be back to deal with the seven churches. I've dealt with the seven churches. I'm coming back now to deal with the seven seals. Seven seals, seven churches, seven seals. When I come back, I'm going to deal with the seven seals. What seal we're on, how many more seals are left, how much time is left, so that you know your assignment is immediate, urgent, very urgent. I'll be right back. I want to I wanna just in this session, I want to thank everyone for your love, for your gifts, uh, the greatest gift that I really... I'm thankful to the Lord is the prayers of the saints covering me with the with just with the blood of Jesus Amen. and speaking uh, just protection, provision, because God answers prayer. I desperately need more prayers because the more I teach on end time, the more I'm under attack. I'm talking about a real attack. I have seen the red dragon. Uh, I've heard him speak to me to stop teaching on the end time prophecies. 
and threatened me and said, I will kill you. It's a real confrontation because, because the devil does not want this message. This is a message the devil hates because he wants a surprise attack on the church, an ignorant church. My people perish because of lack of knowledge. When we know we are pre-armed and ready, when we know these are the last days, then we're not gonna be looking back. We put our hands on the plow. We, we, we're going to, to press deeper because we know we're on broad time. That's why the devil doesn't want me to teach on these things. That's why I come under tremendous attack. Um, and I appreciate those who stand with me every day in prayer that I may be able to finish my assignment and that the church may rise up to their calling in this hour, that there will be such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit without measure coming to the church in these days, the last days, the great days. The greatest church is here now. The remnant is rising up. Um, Jesus is not coming back for a defeated church. Is coming before a triumphant and victorious church without spot, without wrinkle. That means in the midst of the compromise, in the midst of uh, the, the apostasy, there is a remnant that's radically transformed and that are pressing deeper into God. That remnant is the one that's going to rise up just like the apostolic church that rose up and they, they turn the world upside down. That's the, the generation that has begun, a generation of believers that will turn the new world order upside down. Triumphant, miraculous uh, happenings will accompany them, miracles, signs, wonders will, come, will accompany them because they are completely, recklessly abandoned to the Lord because of their singleness of vision, singleness of purpose, they, they are pressing deeper and deeper into God, and there's much more coming, more anointing, more power, more revelation, more joy, more victory, more prosperity. It, God is not gonna be outdone by the devil. The end time belongs to the sons of God, to a church without spot, without wrinkle, to a remnant church, a powerful church, that would triumph over the devil. So I believe in the, in the eschatology of victory, that the church will triumph, that the church will rise, and that the church will be victorious, that this gospel of the kingdom will indeed be preached to every village, to every person on the earth in these days, these final days on earth. God's going to do a quick work, an amazing work, and the army of the Lord is going to be released. It is my prayer that all of you who listen to this will catch the vision. Because the provision is in the vision. There is much more for us in this generation. Many people are afraid when I say the church will go through the great tribulation because they think, oh, the church will fall apart. No, we have been at our best during persecution for 313 years. The church was hunted and persecuted and killed. And the church triumphed and turned the world upside down. Not during the best of times, not with, the, with all the legal protections and all the, 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 the finances. No, without finances, without being celebrated, being hated and despised and, and killed for their faith, the church triumphed. This is why I know, let the devil bring it on. He hasn't seen nothing. There is a church that's not afraid of death. That's not afraid of, of, of all the, the, the things the devil thinks is going to overwhelm the church. The church is going to rise. The remnant is being prepared. And God is going to use them because the spirit of Elijah is coming. The spirit of Elijah is the spirit that will triumph over Jezebel, over Ahab, over the spirit of the Antichrist. They will triumph. There is a triumphant church being raised out of the kings of the east. 
and among the nations, God's doing a glorious work. The spirit is moving. Now, we're going to talk about the seven seals. The seven seals represents the, the end time. The seven seals of the end time. I want to repeat that. There is a reason why I'm going to repeat it. The seven seals represents the last period of the church. And that last period of the church, we are told there will be one sign that God's going to give to signal the beginning of the end. How do we know? Because the scripture tells us that there will be one sign that will mark the beginning of the end. And uh, I want you to write it down. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. He says, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters then will begin to prophesy. What, what is the sign of the end of time? The apostle Peter standing on the day of Pentecost. He says, in the last days, this is how the, the sign of the beginning of the last days is going to be. There will be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit as what happened in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. There will be another outpouring of the Holy Spirit to mark the beginning of the last days. That's why it says, in the last days. The, how do we know the last days? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit says, I will pour my spirit in the last days. So when did the last days begin? 1906, 1907, Holy Spirit poured in Azusa, in California, to mark the beginning of the last days. As Peter said on the day of Pentecost, that will be the sign of the last days. Now, seven years later, we come to the first seal being opened because the Holy Spirit was poured. 1906, 1907, and in 1910, the church for the first time since the day of Pentecost gathered together. I'm talking about the church, meaning not organizational church. I'm talking about, a, now we're talking about an evangelical church filled with the Holy Spirit gathered again together in Edinburgh in 1910. The World Conference on the evangelization of the world to fulfill the great commission to take the gospel to all the nations. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was poured four years before and now they're gathered to pray and to go into all the world. That's the beginning of the global world missions that has brought the Bible to every nation and the gospel to every nation on the face of the earth to fulfill the words of the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost in the last days. The power of the Holy Spirit will be poured and the gospel will now be taken again to the nations of the world. Just like what happened on the day of Pentecost, the gospel was taken to the nations of the world because the power had come upon them. So seven years, seven years later, 1914, the first seal was opened. Because now we are in the last days. So the first seal was opened. And that is the first world war. Because now we are watching the events that were predicted and prophesied. In other words, God always gives us the beginning. He tells us the end from the beginning. He always gives us the time marker. Say from this time, this event marks a new season, a new era, a new epoch. So we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit marking a, the period called the last days according to Peter on the day of Pentecost. And John chapter 2 verse 28 is again says, this, when you see the Spirit being poured, these will be the last days. So we are in the last days that began by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the sign that we're in the last days, the first seal was opened. And the world, world War I broke out because of the first seal. The second seal was opened. The first one was 1914. 
And in 1940, the second seal was opened. There was Second World War. These are great wars that have never been fought since the dawn of time. There has never been a worldwide war where the whole world goes to war. Because at that, earlier until 1914, the world could not go to war. So 1914 marks the first worldwide war where millions of people died. Some say 50 million people. Some say with the, with, with the pandemics that followed, you're looking at 80 to 100 million people died. There's never been a war that killed those many people in a war that was fought all over the world because now we are in the last days, the final days on earth. In 1914, another war broke out. The Holocaust. Millions and millions of people died. We see the, um, you know, we, we, we see the first atomic bomb, Hiroshima, consuming the whole city. Wars that have never been fought before, things that have never been seen before, the technologies that never existed before, now in the hands of people. Why? Because now we are in the last days. As it was in the days of Noah, the last days. These are the last days. And these are the last days that things that has never happened before happened from 1914, World War, First World War, 1940, Second World War. First World War, the purpose of First World War was the defeat of the Ottoman Empire that occupied Jerusalem, Israel. In 1917, The, the Ottoman Empire was defeated. And in 1917, the Balfour Declaration was made for the creation of the modern state of Israel. Because now we are in the days of the restoration. God's restoring the land to the people. He is removing the occupation in anticipation of the redemption, the restoration of Israel back to their ancient land. 1940 to 45, the Second World War. What happened Second World War? The devil knowing that the time for the Jewish people to return to their land to fulfill their biblical mandate to restore the land in anticipation of the coming Messiah. You come back when Israel is in the land that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to Jerusalem. Because Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, rose again, ascended to the right hand of God from Jerusalem, and the angel said, this same Jesus that you see going up to heaven, in like manner, he's coming back to Jerusalem. And that's why the devil tried to wipe out all the Jews in 1940, in the Holocaust, and as a result of the Holocaust, Resolution 181 of the United Nations to partition the land of promise, Palestine, because the time of the restoration has come. And 1948, May the 14th, the state of Israel was born. A fulfillment of biblical prophecy, Ezekiel 36, verse 25 and 20, 26, God says, I'll, re I'll re bring you back to your land in unbelief, and I'll sprinkle the water of cleansing upon you in the land. That's why we are seeing the Jews getting ready to sacrifice to worship God on Temple Mount, to return to their Jewish ways of old, to their to the way God gave to their ancient to the ancient 
uh, Jewish people, the, from Abraham to the crucifixion of Jesus, and of course, to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, for the first time in nearly 2,000 years, they have returned. They've established a, a tremendous country with prosperity. Israel is on the cutting edge of technology. The Lord is blessing them because God said, I will bring you back. Now, many, many believers around the world say, well, but they still don't know Jesus. So uh, we don't know about the the existence of Israel, the protection of God of Israel. We don't know why they are there. You know, they shouldn't be there because there's no need for them to be there. They just need to receive Jesus Christ and be born again. And that's all that matters. Well, it does matter. But God says, I want the children of Israel back in the land in unbelief. So God restored them in their unbelief. And he says he wants them to build the temple on Temple Mount. And that's why in 19... 1948, November the 29th, the resolution was made, 181, to restore the, the, the land to the Jewish people, a portion of the land of the Jewish people. That was the first time Israel was partitioned by the nations of the world. Because Joel chapter 3 says, I'll gather the nations, meaning the nations is referring to the United Nations, the General Assembly that made the... That made the resolution to divide the land of Israel. And that's why I say I'll, I'll judge the nations because every nation participated in the partitioning of the land. And God is going to judge them for that. And there have been sequence uh, resolutions to further divide the land against the will of God. In, 19, in, in 1940, the devils thought, I'm going to kill all the Jews. So there will be no Jew to go back. I'll just you know, holocaust them, put them in, in guest chambers and destroy them in order to stop God's plan. The devil always wants to stop God's plan. The devil thinks he can stop the plan of God. There's no way that the devil and the world can stop the plans of God. We're seeing that right now. The war in the Gaza, the nations, Islamic nations, radical nations, they're all kind of rising up. It's because they think this is an occupation, this is illegal, because they have no full understanding of biblical prophecy. And it's not their fault, it's us. We have not told them, we have not shown them from scripture. We bear the blame. The church has not completely completed their work of informing this generation from the biblical perspective, the issues, the prophetic issues that are being fulfilled, that the world would understand the world politics through biblical prophecy. That's why God is preparing you to be a voice crying out in the wilderness of nations to prepare the way of the Lord. This teaching is not about information to think about, to talk about. This is information for you to form a, a, a strategy to distribute what God has given you because we're distributors of the grace of God, the power of God, the revelation of God to our generation. Because that's what we're called to do, we need to be equipped to know from scripture what time it is, what are the events that are before us so that we are not ignorant because my people perish for lack of knowledge, knowledge of what time it is, knowledge of what God is doing. We can know what God is doing. We can know the plan of God for our generation because it's revealed in scripture. That's why these meetings and these Zoom conferences are critical, important for the church to be able to know what time it is and to prepare for the things that we have been given the assignment. We have a, a place in the divine economy right now, each one of us, to, to do what God has planned for us from the foundation of the world. Because we are his workmanship, created unto good works that God preordained. Now that we are in the last days, we've seen the first seal opened, the second seal opened, um, the first, second seal in, in 1914, and the third seal opened 
in 2008. What is that seal? That was the Black Monday. What, what horse was it? That was the black horse. The first one, the white horse. The second one, the red horse. The fourth one, the black horse and Black Monday, an economic, global economic um, disaster. Uh, when, when we saw the, 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 the crash on, on the eastern markets of, uh, from, uh, from Hong Kong, Tokyo, eastern nations leading that morning into a economic downturn that continued, wiped out trillions of dollars here in America. Black Monday and the Black Horse. You can't miss it. God makes it makes it obvious. But we can't see the obvious until our eyes are opened by the Holy Spirit to see the obvious. 2008, critical year. Seven, seven years from 2008, we see the the four blood moons, the four blood moons announcing that a major event is about to take place. What event was that? That Donald Trump would recognize Jerusalem for the first time after nearly 2,000 years. Because the focus is Jerusalem, it's the epic center of the end game. A very critical moment. Because the sequence of events in the Bible and those sequence of events are laid out for us, encoded in scripture, so that by the spirit of the Lord, we can decode those things and reveal these mysteries so that the people of God can know what time it is and can be able to interpret these things and teach others. We have a responsibility to him much is given, much is required. As I share these things, you have a responsibility to share with your family, with your friends, with your Sunday school, with your city, with your nation, with your generation. 2008, economic, because God's shaking the economy, especially here of America, because the church has been compromised by filthy, Luca, the, 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 the love of money, the preaching for money, the, the, the drivenness for materialism. I remember several years ago when God told me to raise this boy from, from the dead after they have written the death certificate, clinically dead, and the doctor had written the death certificate. Twelve hours later. Dead as a dodo, I mean dead, dead, clinically dead, certified dead. And the Lord said, raise him up as a testimony to this city of Dallas to show them that our God reigns, that he's still the same, that we got to go beyond religion, evangelicalism, to experiential Christianity. I want to, to show my glory. This, this boy has died for the glory of God because I want him raised to show the church that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. That miracles of biblical proportion still happen today. And that boy is now in the U.S. Army, raised from the dead. And after that, a good friend of mine came to me. He said, Robert, we know of the, the boy that you, you prayed for and raised from the dead. A great miracle, isn't it? I said, oh, yes, the Lord, to God be the glory. He said, but I just want to tell you something, that we will not follow you. We only follow money. When you have a lot of money, the, church, the people who come to your church will all be there. With the miracle, we'll call you when we are sick, when we need that, the, the, the miracle. We don't need the miracles. We, we, we are money. We, we look for money. You have money, you have the following. You don't have money, we don't follow. That's what defines the American church. So it's, it's revealing where the hearts of people are in these last days. 
That's why Black Monday was God trying to tell the, the, the church that he can wipe out all our, our resources in one day, in a moment. They could all be gone. That if you put your trust in materialism, in money, in the filthy lucre, it's a dead end because it could be wiped out completely. As a matter of fact, it's going to be wiped out. You, you will not be able to access your money unless you have the number of the beast. That's why the Antichrist strategy is to close bank accounts for those without the number of the beast. That is what will cause the falling away of believers going for the money, not going for Jesus. Compromise because of the love of money. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. That's why the church will not make it. Because they're double-minded. You cannot save two, two masters. You cannot save God and mammon. Mammonism is the God of this generation, of these last days. The church has been dominated by the spirit of mammonism. They are not able to let go and let God have his way and take their resources and sow it in the kingdom of God for the, for the gospel to be preached to the nations and for the kingdom of God to be expanded around the globe. They have been bewitched by materialism. And the churches that preach materialism, prosperity, they are the people that people follow because they want money, because they're not in pursuit of Jesus. They're in pursuit of materialism. I do believe in the prosperity of believers because the Bible is clear. God delights in the prosperity of his servants. There is a place for those who are in love with Jesus to be prospered by Jesus. He will meet all their needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So there is a dimension in which God will open for those who are lovers, who love the Lord, who are sold out to him. He will bless them. He will meet all their needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But it's not a pursuit of materialism, which we saw with the Black Monday, the Black horse rider who brought the economic downturn. And the economic will continue to deteriorate. Now we're moving, the, this black horse is now causing the split of the world. It's removing the dominance of the American dollar as the global currency, bringing a, 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 a split in the stability of the American dollar and stability in the, in the global community, meaning the balance of trade is shaking the very core of our economy, our global economy, because we're moving into, we're moving in areas that we've never been, uncharted waters, where we have the, 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 the East with its own uh, currency, reserve currency, and the West with its own reserve currency, and the instability that's caused, the, because there's more instability coming because of the black horse rider, the economic shakeup the economic global financial reset that's coming and the collapse of the American dollar and the collapse of the global economy. That is coming. It's predicted because the black horse is still here. This is, the, this is why it's so important to be in love with Jesus, to see yourself as a steward of what God has given you. Because if you own money, it owns you. Because what you own, owns you. You are to be a steward entrusted by the, the, entrusted the resources by the Lord to surrender those resources to the, to the Lord, who is the owner, and say, these resources are not mine, they are yours. What do you want me to do with the resources you have given me? Because we're not to own anything because what we own owns us. And we're already purchased with the blood of Jesus. We are owned by God. We cannot be owned by materialism. Our hearts cannot be divided. We have to be single-minded in love with Jesus. Because our security is not in, our, in materialism. Our security is in Christ. In these last days, 
The devil is going to use money to shake the church. And the love of men works cold. And many will take the number of beasts because of mammonism, because of love of money. Because the, the Lord is going to allow this to happen to expose the hearts of men where your heart is. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Now, if your treasure is in heaven, you're not going to compromise because you're, you're in love with the king of kings. But if you're in love with this world and the world to come, you can't make it to the, to the world to come because you will be overcome by the circumstances that will drain your finances, stop you to have, from having access to your finances because you have to be part of the internet of bodies and the new internet of bodies platform 666 to be able to be in the, the global financial reset that's coming. This global financial reset is going to cause these things to become real. And they're going to demand that you denounce Jesus to participate in the global economy. Because of that, God's preparing a people who are sold out to Jesus, not in love with money, not in love with materialism, in love with Jesus. People who know that we're passing through. This is not our home. We, we're going home. The king is coming with the kingdom. So we don't have to be compromised to, to have access to money. We have access to the infinite resources of the king of kings. We have all things in Christ. We can do all things through Christ. There is multiplication of food. There are angels on assignment. Our God is an awesome God. He's not limited to the banking systems of the world. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Therefore, we need to, to be circumcised from the love of money, to be a people completely and totally sold out to Jesus so that the devil has nothing on us. When the devil was coming, the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he said, the prince of this world cometh, but he has nothing on me. I, I'm not in love with his money. I'm not in love with anything. There is nothing in me. I'm 100% for my father. So I'm willing to lay down my life. All of us must be able to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That should be our attitude. It should be an attitude not only of resignation, but an attitude of, grat of, of, of thanksgiving, an attitude of gratitude because of what God has done for us. He's our life, our joy, our peace, our victory, our provider, our healing, our deliverance. He's everything. Because of that, we don't have to bow down to the devil, to the world. We don't have to, to go along in order to get along. We are a free people. When the Son of Man sets you free, you're free indeed. Completely free, free to live a joy-filled life. Free to, to walk with God, unencumbered by the cares of this world. This is the call of this hour. To put your hands to the plow, not look back. Because the world is passing, is pa they're, they're passing away. The world is passing away. But you are called to spend eternity in the kingdom of God. You have place to go. You have things to do for his majesty the king. Because of who you are and whose you are, there is no need to be afraid of the black horse rider who is going to take away global access to finances. Unless you take his number and have this internet of bodies to allow you to access resources, your money. The devil just want to take your money until, unless you worship him. You have to be able to say no. Because I know who I am and I know where I'm going. And money is not my God. This is a message to the body of Christ in this generation. All of us all over the world. Every believer must examine themselves because these are the days of testing. Every heart will be tested. The black 
horse rider is riding across the world. With the war coming, this third world war that's coming, it collapse the whole supply chain, collapse the whole financial system. Everything that's shakeable is going to be shaken. But you're not going to be shaken because you're in Christ. You're in the world, but not of the world. For that reason, you have nothing to fear. You're anxious for nothing. In everything but prayer and supplication, you make your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes, that passes all understanding will just fill your heart. This is why end time prophecy is to prepare us to live to our optimum, to live to our, to our best that God has created us to be, to release our potentiality, our kingdom potentiality, to fulfill our highest calling without encumbrances. That's why God has released the black horse to shake every economy, to shut down the global economy, so that only those who are in love with Jesus who, who go through and those who are compromised will not make it. The young ruler that went to Jesus said, I want to follow you. He says, well, keep the Ten Commandments. He says, I, I kept those from my birth. I, I'm good there. And Jesus said, okay, go and sell everything and give to the poor and come follow me. He couldn't do that because his heart was not there. It was the love of his material possession. He couldn't let go of materialism. And materialism destroyed him. The church is going to compromise to the Antichrist because of materialism, mammonism, because of money. That's why everyone must search their hearts and surrender their lives and their resources to the king. That there has to be an attitude that says, for me to die is Christ and to die is for me to die, for me to die is Christ and, and, and for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That should be the attitude. Willing to live for Jesus and willing to die for Jesus. Willing to be rich for Jesus and willing to be poor for Jesus. To be content in every state. These are the issues of the end time. These are the most critical issues. The black horse. Because the black horse is going to join the pale horse. The pale horse. When was the black horse? 2008. The pale horse. A pale horse is a, is, is a composite horse. It has all the colors of the first horse, the second horse, the third horse. In other words, is the combined impact of the first horse, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, combined into one horse, the pale horse. That means the combined destruction of the First World War, the Second World War, the combined destruction of the, of the black horse, all, com all coming together, a complete... I would say it's a it's like this perfect storm. It's the, the destruction that will come, that will transform this world. Politically, economically, financially, religiously, transforming everything. The pale horse, 2020, the pale horse was released. The pandemics, the wars, the wars and rumors of wars. Ukraine, the Middle East, now in the Horn of Africa, in the Red, in the Red Sea, it's all happening. Iran, the, the proxy wars with America, the, the coming together of the big nations against NATO nations, the alignments being made right now, because we are in a time in which all these things must take place. Why? Because the, the fourth seal has been opened. And once when it was opened, global pandemic, global lockdown, 
complete disruption of the supply chain. This is a sign of the end of days, the end of the world. These are things the Bible told us. These are things that were given as symbols so that we would be able to discern those symbols in order to know how close we are to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why it's so important to know that when the Abrahamic Accord was signed, that was a time marker of the opening of the fourth seal, which opens to the wars and rumors of wars, the pandemics, the global food shortages, the global financial reset, the global political reset, all that is part of the fourth horse. The fourth horse will be fully manifested in 2025. How do I, why do I say in 2025? The, the, um, the Comran community at the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea community of very devout Jewish people who were waiting for the Messiah, who had the anticipation and longing for the Messiah, the essence, a community dedicated to the Lord and to reading scripture. 200 years before Jesus was born, studying the true Jubilee calendar, not the corrupted ju Jubilee calendar from Babylon, but the original Jubilee calendar that the, 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 Black, the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls has. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have the authentic calendar, the Jewish Jubilee calendar, the calendar of God. In studying that, they say that the Antichrist will be revealed in 2025. That is 200 years before Jesus was born. They say 2025, the Antichrist will be on the earth. And I believe it. Because the fourth horse has been released because the fourth horse is the Antichrist. That he is here. All the wars and the rumors of wars we're seeing in the Middle East in Ukraine, uh, the threat with the, with Taiwan, and all this is part of the end game to bring about this gr this global conflict and a nuclear holocaust and the things that are going to happen because we are in the last days according to the Daniel timeline. The Essenes, who had the original Jubilee calendar, concluded that 2025 is the pivotal year, the year when the Antichrist will be manifested on the earth. And the wars that we're watching in the Middle East, the confrontation between the East and the West, between BRICS and, uh, and NATO, the, the, the Israel and, and the, 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 in the Gaza Strip, it's all part of the preparation for a global catastrophe that will usher in the men of peace the false messiah. Will there be a peace conference right now with the Gaza Strip? I've preached on this. Listen to my tips. They will be after Gaza, post-Gaza conflict. What is the result? What is the end game of the Gaza Strip war? Is to create a Middle East peace conference and impose the partitioning of the land. That is Daniel 9, 20, 20, 27. That is the, the duality of Daniel 9, 27. The double fulfillment, the double prophecy. And we will see that as a result of the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is going to produce a Middle East peace. And as a result of that Middle East peace, there will be Israel, Israel will be given the right to worship on Temple Mount. And the red heifers that God revealed to me where to find them 
will be sacrificed in Jerusalem in anticipation of temple worship at the tabernacle of David, because all things must be fulfilled. All scriptures must be fulfilled. There is a literal fulfillment, the allegorical interpretation of scripture, which says, oh, these, these, these things are not going to happen. We are under grace. We don't need the sacrifice. They, that's allegorical. Oh, the temple is an allegorical temple. It's never going to happen. They tried to, to, to explain away the obvious, the clear scripture. Scripture interprets scripture. There's clarity in scripture that the temple we built on Temple Mount, Ezekiel chapter 42, verse 20, there will be a wall around it, built on Temple Mount in Jerusalem as a result of the Gaza Strip War that will lead to a peace agreement that will give the Jewish people the right to worship on Temple Mount. They've been going to Temple Mount right now. They're demonstrating on Temple Mount. And the Palestinians themselves says, the war is about the red heifers because the Jews are about to go on Temple Mount. That's why we're having war with the Jewish people because they all know that there will be a temple on Temple Mount, that the Jews will return to Temple Mount and will worship on Temple Mount. Now, this is an effort to stop it from happening, but you can't stop what God has preordained. Israel will prevail. The Jews will have this peace agreement, and in that peace agreement, the land will be partitioned, and Israel will be given the right to worship on Temple Mount, that all scriptures may be fulfilled in our time. So these predictions are not out there. They are happening right now. You can see them. You can read them on the news. They're real because the Bible is real. Prophecy is real. It gives us the headlines of tomorrow. That's why we know that the Gaza Strip will lead to this false peace. There will be a military peace agreement. Yes, they will settle. Yes, Israel will be on Temple Mount. There will be a sharing of Temple Mount. You see, I can't see that happen. It's already agreed to. In the in 1940, in 1949, there was an agreement that says so. Jerusalem will be partitioned. The, the Russians sponsored a resolution to partition Jerusalem. These things are already on the books. In the in the United Nations Charter, it says Israel has the right to worship on Temple Mount. It's international law. It will be enforced. As they are enforcing land for peace, the 1967 border, as they enforce that, they have to enforce other laws which are on the books, which is Israel's right to worship on Temple Mount. That will happen because God says it will happen. And God already tells us where the temple is going to be built. And the red heifers are there in Israel right now. I just talked to the rabbi in charge of the red heifers. He just called me the other day. He says, hey, what does scripture say? What is prophecy? Daniel says about the red heifer. Well, is this the time? And I said, yes, it is the time. This is what's going to happen. This is I share with him some scriptures concerning this temple. Because they say, yeah, we are getting ready to, to sacrifice. We believe by, by Passover we'll be ready. Or if not Passover because of the war, it will be soon. We're going to do that. Because that's what scripture says. Why? Because it's a confirmation of the biblical timeline. That the timeline that was given to Gabriel, that was given to Gabriel by God the Father, delivered to Daniel by Gabriel, is the correct timeline. There is no other timeline. So we are in the in most incredible time, most exciting time, most glorious time for the church. A triumphant and victorious church is rising up on the earth. And Israel will not be defeated. They will not be wiped out. Israel will be in the land. God has brought them back. To, he will keep them back in the land. You, they won't be thrown out of the land. Yes, there will be great wars, great conflict. But God will be with them. There is a future for Israel in the land of, of promise. Because God promised them the land. He that keepeth Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. So now we here we are, 2024. The war is raging. The war for the partitioning of Temple Mount, for Israel to fulfill their calling to sacrifice on Temple Mount. This is why we're the most excited people, the most blessed people, because we are actually seeing scriptures being fulfilled 
We're living in the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We're living the most incredible time in all of human history. There's never been a time like the time we're living in, the time of fulfillment, the time we can say, this is that the prophet Joel spoke about. The spirit is being poured. This is that which Daniel spoke about. Israel will be divided and Israel will have a covenant with the men of sin. At this conference, the son of petition will be there. And he will be manifested just like the, the Comoran community, the Dead Sea Scrolls say in 2025, he'll be manifested. So will there be a global con war before then? What will usher him in? What will bring the nations together to usher in the Antichrist? All these things are happening and I'm teaching you so that your eyes will be open. So when you read the headlines of tomorrow, you'll be able to say, this is that. This is that. So that you can separate yourself and not be caught up in the deception, manipulation, disinformation. Because there's so much fake narratives out there. The devil is a deceiver in the age of deception. Because we're past the age of reason. We're in the age of AI a senseless, mindless thing. Uh, algorithm to determine your future. God says, no. Man is a spirit in a body. He's bigger than the, um, the scientific breakthroughs, so-called. There will be no superhuman wired to, to machines and computers and in the cloud that all gonna not last because the king was coming with the kingdom and we are the kingdom people appointed for this time in the midst of the chaos the confusion the lies the deception the manipulation of this generation there is a mighty people on the earth anointed for this hour who are sold out to Jesus who see through all that's going on they're not gonna be they're not going to be caught up because the truth sets them free. That's why I'm teaching you the truth. The truth of what time it is, the events that are coming, so that you won't be deceived because the devil is a deceiver. He will deceive the world with peace. Now, finally, the Middle East is settled. There's peace in the Middle East. Wow, we're so thankful. Finally, we can live together because the next big thing is no more wars. Now we can live together. Out of this big war, we don't need weapons of mass destruction. We all gonna be one. There'll be no more war because we have a peace. We have a leader, a man of peace, bringing worldwide peace. And that the, the man himself is the devil himself, because he's a master deceiver. The devil shows himself as the angel of light, but thank God there are people, the kings of the east know what's going on, they're prepared for it, they're prayed up, they're filled up, they're ready to rise and shine for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. This is the calling. This is the reason why we're moving to the Antichrist 2025, 26, and 2027. A temple mount in Jerusalem. Temple on, on Temple Mount in 2027. He comes into that temple. 27, 28, he's there. He persecutes the people of God. And by 29, the fifth seal is opened. Towards the end of 29, the fifth seal is opened. The fifth seal opens the door in heaven. And John sees the souls of those who have been martyred for their faith under the altar, crying out to God, how long, Lord? How long before you avenge our blood? And he says, wait, 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 wait. There's still more that are coming, that are getting ready, that are being cleansed, 
sanctified, prepared for the whole bride of Christ to come together at the end of time in the resurrection, post three pre wrath resurrection. There are yet some more because the great tribulation is for the purpose of the purification of those who are born again and not sanctified. Without holiness, no man can see God. Therefore, God will allow those who are born again and compromised to be cleansed by the fire of the great tribulation. At the end of the dispensation of gentle evangelism, 2027, there is a time and time and a half. Daniel 9, verse 7, a time and time and a half after the end of the times of the of the gentle in 27, a time and time and a half, which is three and a half years. What is that time? It's the time that is mentioned in, in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verse 21, verse 20 and 21, the times of the restitution of all things, which means the time of the final purification of the compromised church. It's the time of the restoration, restoring Israel to Jesus Christ, their Messiah, restoring the, the compromised kind of church through the fire of the great tribulation to prepare a bride without spot, without wrinkle. It is a glorious time. The great tribulation is the greatest time. There should be great jubilation during the great tribulation. Because it's the time of the restoration of the rest of the body of Christ, of those who are born again, but not walking the talk and living the life. They will be purified. None of God's children will be lost. That's why those 42 months are for the final perfecting of the body, cleansing of the body. You say, where is that? Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 to 35, it says the great tribulation is for the cleansing of the church, a compromised kind of church that's not ready to meet the master. The Lord is coming for a church without spot, without wrinkle, and he will create conditions for the church that is compromised to come into holiness through the fire of the great tribulation. Therefore, the fire of the great tribulation is God's second chance to those whose names are written in the book of life, those who have received Jesus and compromised that are not ready, God will make them ready. The devil will not win because whatever he's doing is not going to be for his benefit. It's going to be just for the preparation for the greatest homecoming of the body of Christ from all the nations of the world. When all of God's children shall be gathered unto him. Then shall we ever be with the Lord. The same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in us. As he is, so are we. When we shall see him, we shall be like him. Because in the inside of us is Christ. The apostle apostle is, I no longer live. That Christ lives in me as me. The same spirit that raised him up is the spirit that's in me, the spirit of the Father. The DNA of the ancient of days, the Holy One of Israel. This is why we are the most blessed people. Because we're in the world, but not of the world. So the world has nothing on us. We have nothing to be afraid of. We have nothing to be anxious about. Because he that called us is faithful. He will keep us. He that began a good work in you will finish that work. He will not allow the enemy to triumph over you. You are a victor in Christ. You are victorious in Christ. You are an overcomer in Christ. The devil has nothing. All these things are revealed in Scripture, and everything is going to happen according to the Scriptures. It's not going to happen according to the New World Order, the Antichrist, the false prophet. It's going to happen according to the Scriptures. Therefore, you have nothing to worry about. God, your God, your Father is in control of the end game. If you're pure, there is a preservation of the believers. 
I believe in the preservation of the believers. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. God says, I will keep you away. Not take you away, but I'll keep you away. During that hour of testing that's coming upon the earth. So there is a keeping of the saints through the great tribulation that they will not be victimized by the Antichrist. He won't touch them because they are the anointed of the Lord. They are immortal until their work is finished. So he won't kill them because they already been marked unto preservation. So there is a preservation of all of God's children that are walking in the spirit, that are sanctified. They don't have to be subject to the great tribulation. Because we are now at the beginning of the great tribulation. There is a new financial system that's coming, that's being set in place right now. And the internet of bodies and the connectivity of human body to the machine, to the cloud is here now. Because now we're entering the final stage in which the Antichrist will control the world through the internet of bodies. And because it's here now, you've got to make a decision who you're going to save. If you're going to save God, save the Lord with gladness. He will preserve you, he will protect you, he will provide for you. You say, well, what am I going to eat? Jehovah Jireh is going to give you food. He done that before. He did it with Elijah. He multiplied food. There's nothing to worry about. God's got it all taken care of. He said he will preserve those that are holy, holy and happy. God's going to preserve them. They won't be affected by the great tribulation. They won't be affected by the Antichrist. Nobody's going to behead them because they are, they are holy unto the Lord. They already have a mark. They've been marked by the Lord. They have the, 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 the signature of God, the mark of God on them. And the devil can't touch those who have been marked unto preservation by God. So the issue has to do with how do I prepare for the future? Get prayed up, get filled up, and you will be marked for preservation. You will see these things with your own eyes, but they won't touch you. Psalm 91, under the shadow of the Almighty, in these days. As we can, this is the, the, the fifth seal is in heaven with the souls of those who have been beheaded. And finally, this, the sixth seal, Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 to 17, the rapture. The rapture, 20, 30, 31, Jewish reckoning. The rapture. The rapture is the taking out to meet the Lord in the air of the saints, all of God's saints. Those who died during the great tribulation, those who are alive, those who have died in Christ, all gathered unto him. We're all going home same time. There is no left behind. When you are left behind, when he comes, there is no coming back. We are all meeting the Lord in the air. This is called the first resurrection. The second resurrection will be 1,000 years later. We'll come to that. 1,000 years later, after the millennium, the second resurrection. So the first resurrection takes all of God's children, including the, the persecuted saints who were beheaded, all go together with those who were holy and happy that they were, they were marked for preservation. All of us as God's children will be taken up to be with the Lord in the air. Then shall we ever be with the Lord. This is the glorious hope. This is the blessed hope. We're living in the days of the fulfillment of all prophecy. We are watching prophecy happening all around us. The war that's taking place in the Gaza Strip, in Yemen, in, the, in, in Ukraine, all these commotions, rumors of wars and wars are all that which Jesus spoke about. Because we are now right here leading to the rising up of a new world order. And the head of that new world order is the Antichrist. On Sunday, I'm speaking um, on Iran, Persia, its role in the end game. 
the role of the Gaza Strip in the end game? Where is it in scripture? What does it mean? These are things that you need to track with everything because there's so much in scripture. You have to realize that it took 1,500 years for God to communicate these things. Secrets, mysteries within enigmas, secrets within secrets to be decoded in these last days because all things will be made known in these last days. We are the generation that all revelation is being given because we are about to see the end of all things. This is why I want to say to you at the end of this teaching that there's never been a time so wonderful in the history of the church than the hour we're living in. There's never been such a blessed people as the church that's on earth today. He says, you pour your spirit upon us, our sons and our daughters prophesy. In our pouring of the Holy Spirit without measure is here now. There is a victorious and triumphant church rising up right here as we come to number six, the sixth seal. The sixth seal is the rapture. So the rapture takes place at the end of the sixth seal and the beginning of the seventh seal. When does the rapture take place? Revelation chapter 6. Verse 12 to 17, that is the sixth seal. That's when it's opened. And it's opened, and when it's opened, the church is caught up to me, the Lord in the air. And Revelation 6, verse 17, the judgment of God begins. And when does the judgment of God begins? It begins the, the bold judgment. The, the church is already gone. So, Revelation 6, 17 ends the presence of the church on the earth. And verse 17 says, now is the wrath of God come. Revelation 6, verse 17. So the end of chapter 6, verse 17 begins the wrath of God. And the wrath of God begins with Revelation 7. What happens to Revelation 7? 144 is sealed. And then... The seventh seal is opened, which opens the seven bowls, the seven judgments. Next time when we meet, I'm going to talk about the seven judgments. And I'm going to show you how it's, there is a, there's a sequence of events that are laid out sequentially to give us clarity and simplicity. There is no confusion. Now the church is gone. Now the question is, how is it that chapter 12, chapter 11 talks about the temple? Because this is a trilogy, a layers upon layers. It's going to take us back to the beginning of the Great Tribulation. We will walk you through all that and show you the sequence of events and the, how they correlate together because there is complete polarization, perfect precision in Scripture. No confusion. Amen. This is why it's so important Praise the Lord. to stay with Scripture so that we all can be on one page anticipating the glorious return of our Lord and Savior because we're in the days of our visitation and the revelation is given to us because we're in the last days. These things were not revealed in the past because the time was not yet. Now that the time has come, God has opened the book of Revelation, given us clarity, simplicity, so that we who live in these last days, we will not be confused because our Father loves us too much to confuse us. That is why the, we see the church going up. Now the balls are being pulled. I'm just going to give brief, uh, uh, kind of like give a head start for those who are going to be with us as we continue. I'm going to show you that after the ball judgment, which comes immediately after the church is raptured, they end in verse 10. And when they end, it brings an end to the wrath of God. When the wrath of God stops, it, Revelation begins again to take us back to the church, to the building of the temple. It takes us back and gives us more details so that we have a full understanding of these events. First, it gives us the timeline, the complete timeline. 
Then he explains it layer upon layer, line upon line. That's why in these days, God is opening up all prophecy that we, we as the prophetic people might be able to finish the king's business with simplicity and clarity and prepare the people for this glorious return of our Lord and Savior. I want to say thank you so much. So much for staying with me. I pray that there will be clarity and simplicity because our God is not the author of confusion, that the scriptures will be clarified so that we can run with a vision. That's what this is all about. He that reads the vision will run. Where? To the send of God's will, to God, to prayer, to fasting, to waiting. Because it's all going to be in the, in the closet, on your knees, in prayer. The answer to the end time is revelational intercession. Prayer without ceasing. That's why I am encouraged and strengthened when I hear of all the prayer meetings that uh, are happening all over. The, the kings of the East, in every country in the East, their prayer meetings, all night prayer meetings and fasting, it, it, it's, you're fulfilling your prophetic destiny. I am encouraged because it's actually a prophetic fulfillment, the call of the church in the East to pray. And you're praying. There's so much prayer. And back to Jerusalem movement, it's a, it's a movement to fulfill biblical prophecy. So God is doing it, and we are there to watch what God is doing, to participate in what God is doing. That's why we are blessed beyond measure, the most blessed generation, the generation that will see the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the generation that will see the Antichrist and the failure of the Antichrist, the demise of the Antichrist, the collapse of the Antichrist. We're going to see the triumph of the church with that spot, with that wrinkle. We're going to see the most glorious church on the face of the earth that will again turn the world upside down. That's why we are the most blessed generation, living in the most blessed time. Never has there been a blessed time like the time we're living in. So I want to bless each one of you. I want to thank God for each one of you. I want to pray that the church around the globe that listens to this message will know that the king is coming and we are his sons and his daughters. The kingdom is being transferred to us. So the end is not the, the end for us. It's the end of the, the, the devil and the world. It's ending because God's giving us the kingdoms. So it, for us, it's not the end. It's the beginning. We're in transition from the age of the church to the age of the kingdom. That's why we are the most blessed people and the happiest people. Father, I thank you for the kings of the East. A mighty people. A movement. Not a church, not a denomination, but a movement of people that love the Lord with all their heart, who are pressing deeper into you because you said you come through the Eastern Gate and you raise up the church in the Eastern Gate. They are the one to, to take the, 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 this, this torch to the king. They are running the race that's set before them. They are praying and fasting and seeking you and they're ready to, to, to leave to the ends of the earth because you have anointed them and appointed them for this time. So, Father, I thank you that the best is, is left for the last. Thank you, Lord, that the last shall be first. They're going to be first because they're the last. So, Father, we thank you for the glorious, glorious visitation to the kings of the East. Thank you for allowing me to share with them the timeline, the events that are before them, that they may finish knowing what time it is and how much time they have. So, Father, bless them and guide them and lead them. Let the Holy Spirit rest upon each one of them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Prophet Robert, for spending more than two hours teaching us. And I feel that uh, as you teach on this topic, uh, by layers and layers, our eyes of, uh, our eyes of uh, understanding is enlightened. And uh, to know, in fact, uh, the, what is the hope of this uh, glory that is coming to us. And um, we are looking forward to your teaching on your Sunday uh, service at your church, uh, which will be recorded. And also looking forward to uh, teaching us on the seven bowls uh, when we meet again. 
And we just like to pray for you, Prophet Robert, before we uh, release please, the people. Please. Yeah. Because of what you mentioned about the persecution and the trials and uh, that uh, 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 people are throwing, I mean, the evil one is throwing at you. And let's raise a hand to the prophet and let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, and according to Isaiah 54, verse 17, we declare that no weapon forms against <laughs> you, prophet, will prevail. And uh, you will refute every tongue that accuses you. Amen. Because this is the inheritance of the servant of the Lord, and you are more than a servant of the Lord. You are his mouthpiece. And Amen. this is their vindication from me, say the Lord. So, Father, I thank you for this verse, which uh, we want to bless our prophet and our spiritual mentor. And, Lord, that uh, no weapon again formed against him shall prosper. Father, we bless him. And, Lord, that whatever arrows of uh, uh, condemnation or accusation on his teaching will be dissipated in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. Lord, protect his going out and coming in and his, and his family. family. And Lord, we are just so thankful that we are having this generation to be so blessed, to be revealed layer by layer of all the prophetic uh, verses in the Bible that has been now fulfilled right in our very eyes. We thank you, Abba, in Yeshua's mighty name. And everyone says, Amen. 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 Thank you so much. I felt it. Thanks a lot. If you enjoy this video, do subscribe by pressing this button below. You'll be the first to be informed of any posting that I make. Shalom. Goodbye.